Okay, good morning everyone, thanks for being here. Uh, sorry for the delay in uh, getting started, but uh, we, we thought we wouldn't take much time and then allow everyone to, to come here. Um, it is a huge pleasure and privilege to welcome you to the first summer school of the CPR Standing Group on Extremism and Democracy and to the Scuola Normale Superiore. I shall start off by saying that um, unfortunately the Dean of the Department of Political and Social Sciences, Professor De La Porta, couldn't be with us this morning due to other commitments, but she will join us um, at the end of our sessions on Friday. Um, as I said, it is a honor to welcome you in, in the quality of a Standing Group convener and uh, at the presence of uh, Professor Mude, who founded the Standing Group 19 years ago and actively turns it into a point of reference for scholars and practitioners focusing on extreme, radical, and populist politics. Um, the prospect of holding a summer school, a, a long overdue summer school, uh, I shall add, um, has been uh, long discussed over the course of the past four years um, amongst our um, convenership. But it took the enthusiasm of my friend and colleague, uh, Pietro Castelli, and um, to get the ball rolling, of course, plus the um, general support of the Center for Research on Extremism, CREX at the University of Oslo, uh, the European Consortium for Political Research, the CPR, and the Center on Social Movement Studies, uh, COSMOS, here at the Scuola Normale Superiore, without which we wouldn't be here today, and which we thus uh, thank enormously. We feel that the summer school has managed to bring together some of the finest scholars in the discipline, and presumably um, some of the brightest students from various uh, disciplinary backgrounds, besides different parts of the globe. Um, you students were selected among um, about 100 applicants, confirming on the one hand the remarkable interest prompted by our initiative and the extraordinary relevance of the topic itself on the other. It is for this reason that I would encourage um, everyone to support the activities of the CPR Standing Group on Extremism and Democracy by becoming a member um, on the CPR website. It's easy, totally free, so relatively painless. Um, the Standing Group thrives on the support of its members and we always seek input from our scholarly community. Um, and more information on the working on the Standing Group and how to apply um, can uh, be found on the website of the Standing Group itself. Speaking of support, um, we would like to thank um, Alberta Bacchelli and the whole admin staff here at the Scuola Normale for assisting us uh, throughout the process. Um, Doug Finhagen from uh, CREX from a uh, similar input from the Norwegian end of this organizational machine. Silvia and Stefania at the front office, uh, plus Francesco for um, managing uh, the live streaming of the event. Uh, all the professors who have enthusiastically agreed to be part of this project this week, uh, throughout this week. And last but not least, you students for putting trust in us. And uh, on this note, I leave um, the floor to uh, Pietro. Yeah, just a couple of words <clears throat> before leaving myself the floor to Cass. And uh, I just wanted to say a couple of of the ideas that we had uh, with Andrea when, uh, when, uh, when we decided to organize this, uh, this summer school. So what, what, uh, what we have tried to achieve with the summer school was uh, to build a space uh, fully devoted to uh, young scholars and students working or uh, wishing to work in this ever-growing field of research that is uh, the, the studies on right-wing uh, populism and, and extremism. And as Cass will illustrate uh, in his speech in a moment, in the last uh, decades, uh, the, uh, the amount of academic attention uh, on these uh, topics has been uh, growing uh, at unprecedented levels. And what is more, the relevance of this phenomena also uh, called on the attention of scholars from various different disciplines, uh, which uh, use different means, different types of research designs, different methods uh, to, uh, to study this phenomenon. While this, uh, while this confirms the relevance of the topic, it also pro poses new uh, challenges. And we believe that two of those uh, uh, challenges uh, or responsibilities for scholars engaged in this field of research uh, are the ones that we want to uh, uh, address with the summer school. And on the one hand, 
the need uh, to create and sustain a connection uh, between different generations of scholars that have been engaged in this type of studies. So the, uh, let's say, the more established uh, uh, type of scholars uh, and, and the ones that uh, aim at becoming ones uh, in, the future, in the future years. And second, also, uh, the need to build a more deep dialogue between these different scholarly approaches by which the far right is studied and, uh, and understood. Uh, including sociological, political, science, anthropological, and historical ones. Um, the idea of this summer school was uh, thus precisely that of creating a connection between disciplines and uh, between generations uh, that are engaged in the study of the far right. What we wish to uh, achieve at the end of the summer school is that the students that are participating in this are not only uh, familiarized with different methods and different, uh, and different literatures, but they, that they can also engage in uh, types of research that they were not uh, uh, accustomed to before, uh, and that they can try to address their research questions with uh, methods and, and approaches coming from, uh, from, different, uh, from different disciplines. In this, in this sense, what we want to achieve is to try and make one step forward towards a more uh, pluralist understanding of research on the far right in its uh, populist, radical, and uh, extremist uh, manifestations. Uh, this is also why we couldn't think of anyone better than Cass to uh, kick off uh, this, uh, this summer school. Um, Cass needs no presentation. Uh, actually, he's one of the world's uh, leading experts on populism, a associate professor at the um, uh, School of Public and International Affairs of the University of Georgia, and also a researcher at the Center for Research on Extremism at uh, the University of Oslo. And <clears throat> without further ado, I will actually leave you the floor for the first keynote of the summer school. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I. Um, I must say, when I when I got it, I was uh, I felt a little bit forced um, because I was planning uh, what turned out to be recently grueling summer. Um, I'm now six weeks in, um, but I'm in the single digits uh, for going home. And I thought going to Florence is like first of all, it's always difficult to get to Florence, um, and there are always a lot of tourists. <clears throat> but then again. It was my standing group as well as my C-Rex coming together. And so I thought, yeah, let's do that. Um, and then when I actually thought about it and the idea of bringing together graduate students for a longer period of time, um, I was very enthusiastic because um, we actually did that in, a, in the Netherlands, when I was a PhD student, we had summer schools for all Dutch PhD students in political science, which at that point in time were about 20 or something. Um, and we, just, we were together for about a week, and the relationships that you built during such a structure are so much better than when you see each other at a panel conference or something, and, and you just get deeper, and you get a connection beyond simply your work. And so I, I really hope that, that that will be created here as well. Um, despite the fact that you look at free men, I think it's also important that um, the organizers have worked really hard to get um, a lot of female participation, which I know was not always easy because a lot couldn't make it. And obviously there are a lot of women among the researchers, which my own experience has been the case in general. Um, there are a lot of women studying um, the far right, and the next keynote will be by Kathleen Blee, which I saw give a keynote at the beginning of um, my trip six weeks ago, and it, it was phenomenal, so it's going to be really good. Now, <clears throat> this is a bit memory lane type of talk, but let me just uh, give you the background of the standing group. Um, so I came up with the idea to start a standing group in 1998 when um, I just 
had defended my PhD in Leiden and I was working at Central European University. And at that point in time, there were very few people working on radical right and extreme right parties, particularly outside of Germany. Actually, when I started, and I just met him uh, last week, um, I sent, I sent a, a letter, yeah, I sent a letter to four different scholars um, <clears throat> just to get some kind of connection, and, and two of them responded. One was Roger Eatwell, with whom I then later founded this group, and who has been absolutely instrumental to the standing group and I think to the study of the far right, because together with him, I also started the, the Routledge um, book series on extremism and democracy, which has since been really, really enthusiastically supported by Craig Fowley, who is um, now a big honcho at Routledge. At that point in time, he was the editor of Politics and International Relations. And to be honest, he only supported it because Roger Eatwell was in it, because he was well known and, and I was no one. But obviously, I did a lot of the work. That's how it works. And I, mean, I, I have no regrets whatsoever about it. Um, the other one was Uwe Backes. And Uwe Backes is one of those many Germans who write about the far right, and like in the 90s, pretty much only Germans wrote about it. And I just remembered meeting him again. At, like, Uwe sent me four books um, just out of nowhere. And I mean, that, that was about 10% of what I could read, because at that point in time, even Leiden University, which has an amazing library, um, had really few books on the radical right. Now, of course, you don't have that problem. You have the problem of having way too much to read, um, and this is something that I'll talk about. And I think what is one of the greatest things about bringing together people with different perspectives is that that is one of the things I miss a lot in the literature at the moment. Um, and it is a direct consequence of having so much to read. Like if you just read every single article about explaining voting behavior of radical right voters, right, you, you, that's all you can read. Like you just can't read anything else. Um, and so the, 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 the trick is to get to make those decisions better, to kind of read the important stuff on the radical right, specifically on what you're busy with, read a little bit broader on the radical right, and then also just read broader. So <clears throat> today the, the, the focus and the argument that I'm going to make is that the study of the far right has to catch up with the far right. And the far right has gone through phenomenal development over the last, I would say, 20 years. The far right in the 21st century is, in many ways, a different, a different animal. Not necessarily because the far right itself changed, but because the context in which it operates changed. And so these two pictures give an example. So on the left, that's Hans Janmaat. We won't know, and there is very little reason to know him. But in 1982, Hans Janmaat was elected to the Dutch parliament. He had one seat at 0.7% of the vote. And the Netherlands was up in arms for months. There were tens of thousands of people demonstrating when he was inaugurated. And there was a massive, massive debate. And the end was near. Right? And then on the right, you see a picture of the presidential election in Austria, 2016, where at a certain point in time, <coughs> the far-right candidate, Norbert Hofer, was drawing 50% with Alexander van der Bellen. And in the end, van der Bellen won through an extra round, whatever it was. but And we were celebrating the defeat of a far-right candidate with 49%. Right? And it's remarkable what kind of victories at the moment we're celebrating. Think about Marine Le Pen, 
who only got one third of the vote. Right? And most people were pretty chuffed about that. It's like, that's only one third. <clears throat> and so this is, this is a kind of a normalization which is understandable as, I mean, leaving aside the normative af aspect, not particularly problematic, but of course it, it gives you an indication of where we are. And, and if you have <clears throat> a radical right that is increasingly in power, that is getting these types of results, you should update the way you look at it. And, um, and this is what I will talk about. So Tim Bale in a review article wrote that there is an insatiable demand for studies of far-right parties. And um, that is still the case, even though now the insatiable demand is mostly for populist parties. But, and sadly enough, many people write about the radical right as populist, and obviously they're not interchangeable. There has been a study of far-right parties that has become a coterie industry that truly produces more output than the study of all other party families together. This is an overview. And so at certain point in time, there are about five to seven times as many articles on far-right parties, however termed and of all the other parties together, even though on average far-right parties get about 12% of the vote throughout the EU. Right, so it's completely and utterly disproportional, which, I mean, this is partly the wrong room to make that argument, but, and I understand, it's sexier. If I would have written my PhD on social democratic parties, I would be as irrelevant as social democratic parties today. <clears throat> but it is important to keep things in perspective and, and um, to understand that while we might be more concerned about radical right parties, that isn't necessarily because they are more successful than other groups. I just saw a graph that actually showed that of the last few crises, the radical right profited a lot, but conservative parties profited even more. And there's virtually no one working on conservative parties. So, I mean, perspective is, is important. But what I talk about today is that the field has gone through several waves and more or less explicit paradigmatic shifts. Um, and I will argue that we should, we should have another one. So, <clears throat> up until 1980, what Klaus von Beime called kind of the first two waves of post-war right-wing extremism, as he called it, <clears throat> there were very, very few studies. The studies were mostly historical. The key term was neo-fascism or neo-Nazism. And the main question was, what is the continuity with historical fascism? And so most of those studies, they often actually had, the bulk of the book was about historical fascism. And then there was a final chapter where they looked at what is there today. And if there were studies of purely the post-war phenomenon, then they were looking at like which people are in those parties that are still that, that used to be in the fascist movement, or what kind of themes. It was, to a certain extent, completely decontextualized. Like, it wasn't seen as something relevant to post-war politics. It was just a personal holdover from that period, which would die as soon as those people would die. It was the focus on a few small parties, and particularly one Roger Griffin called groupuscule, like insanely small groups, sometimes really just three, four people. Um, the most important ones were the MSI here in Italy, which of course for a very, very long time was exceptional. Um, the National Front in Britain and the NPD in German. The prime language was German to a lesser extent French and English, but I mean, we're talking about seriously a handful of books. Um, in the 1980s, we saw a transition 
1980s, of course, saw the, the, the rise of what was the third wave of post-war far right in, in von Weimar's terminology. Um, political parties starting to emerge in more countries, modest, but nevertheless. The studies were now mostly descriptive. <clears throat> they were describing these different groups, when were they founded, and electoral results, kind of who's the leader. And the main term now became extreme right, which was still very much a term in line of fascism studies. Almost all of the definitions of extreme right were some form of a modernized version of the fascism discussions and national socialism, but they have weeded out some of the issues that were specific to the 1930s, 20s. Um, <clears throat> but the theoretical framework was still very much one of fascism studies. <clears throat> and the key question now was what is old and what is new about the extreme right? And so it was not purely seen as a phenomenon that was a holdover of the fascist period, but it was still primarily seen through that lens. Um, the main focus was on newer parties, center, center party in the Netherlands, Front National, MSI, MPD, Republicana, and Vlaams Belang. The prime language definitely was still German, but there was more and more English. I mean, at that point in time, which was roughly when I did my PhD, um, I mean, there, there was more in German than in all languages together. Um, of course, most of the German literature was about Germany, where the radical right was actually not that relevant. And, and this is another problem that the literature had very strongly then, but still has today, a disproportionate number of articles and books about a few parties, of which several were not necessarily the most relevant. The only, that it, only party that's really well studied and is relevant is Front National. But other parties that were disproportionately studied were the British National Party, which never went anywhere really, or the Republicana, which was, but a party like the Swiss People's Party right, has barely been studied. Um, the part, party like Vlaams Belang, which is now relatively small, but in the 1990s was one of the most successful, was barely studied, even in Dutch, but outside of Dutch, very little. And so we always had this kind of disproportionate um, focus on, on individual countries, and it's normal. Always the big countries are studied. And by and large, if, like, my first book, which was my PhD, was rejected by one publisher because I didn't have France in it. There was no theoretical argument why I needed to have France in it, but France sells, like Germany sells, Britain sells, like the Switzerland, Belgium, and the Netherlands don't sell. So there's always that, that aspect, but it leads, of course, to, to, a, to a problematic and skewed view. Now in the 1990s, we have the real innovation it's an expansion which is a direct consequence of the fact that the parties become more uh, relevant. The studies are becoming more analytical and theoretical. And there's an integration of insights from study of political parties. Most importantly, Hans-Georg Betz, Piero Ignazi, and um, Herbert Kitchell. And all three are really people who who study political parties. Now, Betts and Kitchell both had studied Green parties before. And so the Green parties were kind of the new party family to come out, and because most scholars were very sympathetic to the Greens, they liked to study them. And of course, we had Inglehart with his Silent Revolution book, who had a theoretical framework. And this was all part of progress. Like the world is, was going to be a much better place and we were going to be post-materialist and whatever. So it was very sympathetic, but then the radical right came and that didn't really fit this story. Um, and so it was confusing, even though, for those of you who have read Inglehart, you should go back to it because he actually does say something about the rise of the radical right. Um, <clears throat> And so Betts and Kitchell looked f of, used that framework of um, green parties and applied it to radical right parties. Similarly, I mean, Piero, who by and large, like, I, 
still believe wrote the best article on the radical right, the silent counter-revolution, which obviously is directly based on Inglehart's uh, silent revolution. And um, what this did was, it for the first time integrated the radical right into mainstream political science, which in certain countries was very controversial. Um, I got scolded at various talks in the 1990s for using mainstream categories and theories for studying the radical right, because at that point in time in the Netherlands and in Germany, it was all very ideological. And with that, I normalized the radical right. The idea was this is, this is not acceptable, and therefore we cannot kind of tarnish our mainstream concepts and theories by applying them. Um, and so I think it's interesting that it came through these people um, to a certain extent from context where the radical right was more normal. I mean, Piero, of course, from Italy, and both Betz and Kitschel, <coughs> while being German, they worked in the US. Um, and so they, they had a more scientific kind of neutral view on it. The term also became radical right increasingly or right-wing radicalism. And the key question was, what explains the demand for radical right parties? And this was implicitly or explicitly the normal pathology thesis um, of Klingemann and Scheuch, which I mean, very few people read, but I mean, some of the Germans did. And um, it, by and large, was this idea that the radical right itself didn't belong to post-war society, um, but there was a small group of people who just couldn't kind of deal with the complexities of post-war society, and that's why they held on to this. And the only conditions under which radical right could be successful was under crisis. And that was a very strong uh, belief, be it implicit or explicit, and so people were really confused about why anyone would have a demand for radical right politics. Now the focus is mainly on the few successful parties, Front National, um, FPÖ, and Lega, at that point in time still Lega Nord. Um, that was one of the problems with some of the studies. They didn't have negative cases. They only focused on the few that were successful. And then of course you get into explanations that that have problems like globalization, which is a non-concept in a theoretical terms anyway. But if you're going to look only at positive cases, then all of the things that happen everywhere will stick in because you don't have a negative case. If they would have seen the BMP, they would have seen that Britain also has globalization and therefore that in itself cannot explain it. Um, the prime language now became English. And then in the 21st century, we have an integration, although it's going slow. The studies are now increasingly comparative and quantitative, which up until even the 1990s, most were qualitative. There's a stronger emphasis on voting behavior and support in elections. There's full terminological confusion and the rise of labels, including populism. I mean, you all know how many different terms there are. Um, the French still hold on to extreme right. They're the last ones virtually. But, um, and then all kind of populism things. And the key question is why are populist radical right parties successful? Now, I have to admit this is mostly a political science talk. Um, but I would argue that since the 1990s, political science has been absolutely dominant in terms of output on the radical right. I mean, again, when I did my PhD, I read a lot of sociology journals and social psychology journals um, simply to find stuff on the radical right. Um, now, with the exception of the American radical right, where there was very little in political science, in Europe, um, political science is dominant. So the focus is still on usual suspects, <coughs> but the group is getting broader. And so parties like <coughs> uh, the Fremskrit Partit in, in Norway or the Lispin for Tain are included, 
which, which are more borderline and, and are also a bit debated. Now this debated issue has always been the case. FPO was very long debated, whether it was a radical right party or, or a liberal party. Lega was very long debated, whether it was a regionalist party or whether it was a radical right party. The argument that that would be mutually exclusive was always a bit problematic. And so the basic changes in the field where we went from descriptive historical studies to analytical political science, and let me be clear here, you can be analytical and qualitative. This is it's no code word for quantitative. We went from a few big European countries to a pan-European focus in the late 1990s. Central and Eastern Europe was included, although it's still very, very little work being done on that. Um, from politicized labeling to academic, if confused, conceptualization. Um, at the beginning, it was all neo-fascism. That was not only an analytical choice. Uh, it was also to link these parties to historical fascism and make clear that they were out of bounds. I think we're, we're already out of the, the kind of terminology hype. Um, I would say the late 90s, early 21st century, everyone needed to have their own term. Don't get me wrong, I've used more than enough terms myself. Um, and and there's like, there is something to be said for conceptualization, and we're going to talk about that. Um, but much of the terminology w was not really followed by actual conceptualization. Um, there wasn't much thinking about it. It was more thinking about how to come up with a different term so that I get cited than how to come up with the best concept that captures this phenomenon better than others. We went from books at non-academic publishers to mainstream publishers and journals. Um, we went from political parties to far-right voters. I mean, to put it, <coughs> just to summarize it, the radical right was mainstreamed. And so, on the one hand, studies on the radical right started to use more concepts and theories and literature from mainstream political science, social science, and mainstream political science would also write about the radical right. It would be part of a description of European politics. In terms of paradigmatic shifts, we went from demand side to supply side or a combination of the two. After a while, we finally figured out that actually there was quite a lot of demand. And that in itself didn't explain enough. Um, I remember Wouter van der Brug and a few others, like kind of calculating the potential for radical right parties in different countries and the small percentage of that that was actually caught by radical right parties in many countries there was kind of a radical right potential of sometimes up to 50% of the population, and yet parties were scoring only 6 or 10%. And so no longer were we overly amazed by the fact that there was a demand for the radical right. We're now we're trying to figure out why are they not using it so well. We moved a little bit from only the external supply to the internal supply. Most of the supply side studies were everything outside of the radical right. What do other parties do? What is the political opportunity structure? It is remarkable how little studies on the far right actually study the far right. right? When you look at almost every electoral study, the far right is irrelevant. The parties are perceived to be exactly the same. It doesn't matter whether they are led by a charismatic leader or a monkey. Like, as, so, as soon as they come up, they will do certain things. Right? Um, it was very rare to have interviews with leaders, people going to meetings. Um, not much better, but it's a, a, a little bit better. Um, and to be honest, I always felt that I could almost like see on the basis of reading, a, particularly a book, whether someone had actually ever met a radical right person or not. Um, it's very interesting, and if you haven't done it yet, 
you should go to a meeting. I was just two weeks ago, I was at a Vlaams Belang meeting in Ghent. Um, I hadn't been in a long, long time. I was pretty surprised. I thought they were a bigger crisis than, than that. They pulled off a pretty good show. But one of the things that you will see, because I went first to meetings of Dutch parties and then to meetings of the Flemish, and it directly made sense why one was more successful than the other. I mean, the Dutch couldn't pull off a meeting of 100 people. It was a mess. And then I went to Antwerp, and there were, I don't know how many thousand people in, in that room. And it was this show of two hours of smooth like lectures and videos and whatever. And like, that explains in part why a party is successful, because you need, you need to be able to organize stuff. right? And so <clears throat> I think that we need to take into account what radical right parties do. We have to look at leadership beyond the reasonably simplistic charismatic leadership, like leadership within the party. How is a party governed? Like the example that I use in my book for example, is like Jean-Marie Le Pen, which gets all the attention, but Bruno Maigret, who was the second man, was at least as important because he built the whole organization. Um, we need to understand the propaganda much better. Um, prop propaganda of Front National has been amazing, has been incredibly innovative. Um, we all know pretty much the poster of the SVP with the white sheep kicking out the black sheep. Sure, it's the most racist poster you can find. It's also by far, like, I think, the best poster ever made because it says creating security. But even if you don't understand German, if you see that picture, you know exactly what it's all about. Right? And so that has an effect. Good propaganda has an effect. Maybe not as much as some of the media makes it out to be. But we have to understand what the, what the radical right does itself. It's also become a bit more <coughs> from just a dependent variable, an independent variable. Rather than explaining why the radical right is successful, we now try to explain what their effect is. Um, it's still not that big. It should be because the radical right is getting into more governments and they're clearly setting the political agenda. And so I think that type of study is important. And I think that an argument I've been making is that radical right, populist radical right is more a pathological normalcy than a normal pathology with what I mean that Radical right is really a radicalization of mainstream values. Um, I think that's getting uh, more and more accepted. And I was just a few days ago, someone challenged me on that and said, like, do you think that's still the case? Of course, meaning like, are they still a radicalization of mainstream values? Just think about Kurz and Strache. Like, how, much, how much space is there between the two? a lot less, right? And so <clears throat> what is important is that, yes, the radical right is changing, but the mainstream is changing too. And to a certain extent, we should study both because the radical right has changed the mainstream, but the mainstream is changing the radical right in very different ways, like in certain ways by moderating. Like Strache had a very soft campaign, for example, with arguing that Kurtz was kind of too moderate, but not that he was corrupt or bad, because he knew that they were going to govern. And so you have a moderating effect. But in Hungary, it went even totally extreme. Fidesz, by and large, became as extreme as Jobbik. And because Jobbik no longer had any space on the far right, they just moderated. And by and large, they exchanged positions. So in the last campaign, last elections a few months ago, like Jobbik campaigned as kind of the mainstream right party, and Fidesz as the radical right party. Right? <clears throat> those, those are interesting things, and, and putting the radical right in, in, in context, I think, is important. I think we need a new paradigm shift. Most importantly, we have to move beyond the new challenger paradigm. Like we still treat the radical right as new parties. And most of them are not. Like 
the interesting thing, for example, the coverage of the Italian coalition. Like, first of all, obviously not the first populist coalition in, in Europe or Italy. Um, but also, like, there is this, still this assumption that, oh, what is Lega going to do? Can they, can they govern? Yes, they can. They've been in government more than virtually any other party at the moment. Like, and so we think, we look at the far right and we, we see AFD, like new party, instable, whatever. But FPO is one of the oldest parties. SVP is one of the oldest parties. Lega is one of the oldest parties. Like even Sweden Democrats has never been in power. Like it's various decades long. Most parties have survived their founder leader. Um, and so we have to look at them different. <clears throat> it's also important that several have governing experience. Um, and so this idea that when you take a radical right party into government, they will blow up because they're incompetent and et cetera, et cetera. And people always point to the FPO, which split, and the LPF, like Lisbon for Town in the Netherlands. Now, Lisbon for Town was, what, three months old by the time they went into government, and its leader was killed. Okay. Actually, the members of parliament of LPF had never met each other before seeing themselves each other in the parliament. Not that surprising that that party will implode. It has nothing to do with ideology, whatever ideology they would implode. FPO did implode and are now back as strong as they were before in the government. Right? So it's, it's very clear that these kind of simplistic views don't actually hold. The, sim the same thing is this idea, well, if they're in government, they will moderate. Depends. Some have, many haven't, and have done pretty well out of it. Um, we don't have to speculate only on the basis of that, because actually we know. Um, there's this really good book by um, Daniela Albatazzi and Duncan McDonald about populist in power. That look at Lega and look at SVP and the Swiss Lega. And leaving aside that it, that it shows like the stability of it, it actually very interestingly also shows how realistic the activists of the party are. who are actually very happy with what those parties in power do. They don't have ridiculous expectations. They know that they have to compromise. And all those things that go against pretty much the, the cliche type of understanding that we have about those parties. And, and again, I think a lot of these things we can study now. They're also neither new nor niche in an empirical or theoretical sense. I'm not a big fan of the whole niche concept, um, but the idea of a niche party, the way it is, it is um, operationalized and defined, is parties that don't primarily campaign on social economic issues. Over the last 10 years, Many campaigns, perhaps most campaigns in Western Europe, have been predominantly about social cultural issues. Like, so this whole concept of mainstream politics is about social economic issues and niche politics is about social cultural just doesn't hold up anymore. Now, of course, they're also not niche in terms of having only a small basis and a small support. In many countries, radical right parties are third biggest party if not bigger. Um, and so these are, these are concepts that might still have relevance in certain countries, but overall should be problematized. In fact, the whole distinction, the whole term of mainstream parties is highly problematic these days. Like mainstream parties are really liberal democratic parties, but what mainstream refers to is either ideological mainstream or kind of what the big parties are. In both terms, the radical right in many countries is mainstream. Um, so we have to update. And I think in most aspects, parties like FPÖ, Front National, definitely SVP, they're much more like established political parties. One of the things that is very interesting, and I'm now doing a, a project on youth branches of radical right parties together with Duncan and Anne-Catherine Junger, uh, Anders Jupskas. Um, and the reason why we did it was we saw more and more leaders of radical right parties 
that come out of the youth party, which again is exactly what is the case in other political parties. That is the way that you socialize your people. <clears throat> the best example is Tom van Grieken, who is the leader of the Vlaams Belang and was elected leader of Vlaams Belang as, well, when he was the leader of Vlaams Belang Jongeren, of the youth group. Um, and so many radical right politicians are professional politicians. They haven't done anything else just like most politicians are professional politicians. And so I think to understand these parties better, particularly the more successful ones, we, we really have to think about just how do other parties function? What is the role of socialization um, and other things? Now, obviously you already all have your topics, so you can ignore this, but I think there's an enormous amount of things to do on the radical right, but unfortunately, much of what I see being done are things that have been done over and over. Um, I'm very skeptical, and my apologies for the people here that write their PhD on it, but I'm very skeptical of any study that is about why are radical right parties successful in Western Europe. Um, I've read at least a hundred pieces on that, I seriously doubt you have better data than these people. Um, and there's only so much you can say about it. Now I do understand, and don't get me wrong, because uh, yes, I'm an old person who, who is very much complaining about like what all these new kids are doing. And to be honest, I'm actually complaining a lot about what the old kids are doing too. That's not the point. I understand perfectly the political economy of, of academia, which is terrible and which pretty much incentivizes very narrow work and makes more risky and therefore more interesting work uh, very problematic. But I still think that, that, that we can do a bit better. There are various topics that have not been dealt with much. The issue of religion and the radical right. There's this book by Oliver Wa, Duncan McDonnell, and um, forgot the other one, which is a little bit about Islamophobia, but also what the consequences of that are. Like logically, if you define the other primarily in ethno-religious terms, you're going to define the us in ethno-religious terms too. Like there has to be some kind of relationship between us and them. You see that FPE comes out of an anti-clerical tradition now they have become kind of the voice of one of the most orthodox Catholic Islamophobes, right? Um, even Geert Wilders, who, I mean, no one is as Islamophobic as Geert Wilders, is, is a single issue politician. He initially was kind of anti-Christian in the sense that he believed that having specific Christian schools as the Dutch have, which are subsidized, was a problem because through that rule you could have Muslim schools. Um, and so he wanted to by and large abolish all special schools. And he has gone back on that and is now much more Judeo-Christian um, than before. But there are other aspects of religion in it. Of course, in Poland, religion plays a role. And in the United States, uh, all types of religions and quasi-religions are very important to the radical right. Um, I, think, I think a lot can be said about it. Um, I think gender is still very much under study. I'm very happy that we now have more studies about women and the radical right, but women and gender are not exactly the same thing. Um, and so at times we have, we have I mean, chapters or articles about women and the radical right which really don't talk about gender. They, it's just a zero one um, and it misses a lot. But having heard Michael Kimmel with his keynote about masculinity, and the far right really opened my eyes. I think we speak very little about masculinity. It plays clearly a major role for smaller groups. I think there are aspects about it that also play a role 
within the radical right, and not only actually the radical right, broadly conservative um, movements these days. Um, there's a lot of white victimhood, but there's also a lot of male victimhood at the moment. And one of the things that, that masculinity can explain perhaps is a phenomenon that we see in the so-called old right but we see it in some other movements too where higher educated young men are attracted to far right narratives, which traditionally doesn't make sense. Um, but like my own country, Forum for Democracy, which is the newest radical right party, um, which has a completely different uh, back uh, basis than Geert Wilders' um, Party for Freedom. Like Thierry Baudet, who is the leader of Forum for Democracy, speaks to groups of several hundred of predominantly male students. And like, sure, they're undoubtedly also Islamophobic, but that's only a small part. You don't need to go to Forum for that. We have many Islamophobic parties in the Netherlands. Um, they're not losers of globalization in any way, shape, or form. Um, but his ideas about masculinity and about feminazis and whatever, like clearly are, are hitting a nerve. Um, I think femininity is very interesting. I have a, a, a grad student, um, Alex Snipes, who, who wrote a very interesting uh, paper about the perception uh, media coverage of Marine Le Pen in French and in American newspapers. Um, it's, it's very interesting, particularly because uh, coverage of women in the media, female politicians, is, is always problematic. And so it's generally softer. Women are perceived as not really that ideological, kind of accidental politicians, etc., etc. Now, the interesting thing is that we also have a radical right frame on the media, which is actually very hard. Like the radical right is always seen as uncompromising, as zealots, as very radical. And so what, what comes out of that study is that radical right women actually have a more accurate frame than either women or the radical right. Because it kind of compensates a too soft and a too hard frame. Um, there are many things about gender and perception that are interesting. Um, we still don't fully know why there are so few women among the electorates. Um, do female leaders have an effect on the gender gap? <clears throat> All of these things, I think, can be studied better. You know, very little about youth, which is for the to think a non-political scientist, but like sociologists. Um, <clears throat> we know that most people are socialized politically in their late teens. And pretty much the attitudes that you have in your early 20s are the ones that you keep. Yet we start to study people at 18 most of the time. Right? The same with radical right groups. Most people join or get in the orbit of these kind of groups before 21, before 18, really. Right? And we don't study them really at that point in time. Um, we don't see how they're socialized. We don't have panel studies of kids following them from 12 to 21. That requires resources, I get that, but I think it's important to look at youth and there are all kind of IRB problems. And, and then of course there's the beautiful picture of the SVP I was talking about, propaganda. Like, we still know very little about it. We actually know very little about who created what, how they, how they come from one group to the other. This sheep poster was used by at least five or six other parties. Right? And so how does that work? Is that random or does that go further? Vlaams Belang stole all of its propaganda from Front National in the 1990s, for example. MPD was very important in the 80s. I think um, probably, particularly for political scientists and people studying parties and, and, and voters, I think we should focus much more on the diversity within the far-right party family. Um, the parties are incredibly different 
in many different ways. Um, so first of all, how old they are. Like, AFD day was 2013. That's indeed a very young party. FPO was initially founded in 55, 56. Right? Even uh, what is the Front National had his 45th birthday. Um, even Geert Wilders is the third longest serving uh, parliamentarian in the Dutch system. So we have in terms of like age, very different ones. In terms of organization, Geert Wilders is the only official member of his party. Like Front National has tens of thousands of members. It's not logical that they would operate in exactly the same way. Ideologically, within the far right broadly defined, but in a lot of particularly electoral studies, you will see Golden Dawn and Progress Party. Right? Now, I'm sure that we all agree that we live, that we would much rather live in a Progress Party country than in a Golden Dawn country. And that we're not going to say, well, it doesn't really matter that much whether we, we're governed by right-wing populists or neo-Nazis. Like, so it's a very broad group. <clears throat> um, I think we should think more about the idea of functional equivalence. And functional equivalence is a term that is used in the party literature to talk about Christian Democrats and conservative parties. And so the argument is that in most party systems, you only have, you either have a Christian Democratic Party or a conservative party. You rarely ever have both. But they, they perform the same function within the political system. They are the opposite pole of the center-left party, of the Social Democrats. And so while they have somewhat different ideologies, within the party system, they perform a similar function. So functional equivalence is always contextual. So Golden Dawn and Progress Party could be seen within the electoral arena as functional equivalents, as the parties most to the right that feed off anti-establishment sentiments and anti-immigration sentiment. On an ideological level, they're not functional equivalents. In terms of organizational structure, like Party for Freedom, and Front National are not functional equivalents. Ideologically, they are. So that's what I mean with theoretically developing functional equivalents, too. One of the problems that we have is categorization of which parties are in, which parties are out. And one of the things that people often solve that, because you don't want to do that yourself, because it's a lot of work, is you look at other articles and say, well, they kind of use it. but. They use it for different purposes. And so I have much less problems of including the Progress Party into a study of electoral support than into a study of ideological equivalence. And so in that sense, I think it is important to look at for your specific question, right? what, are the, what are the parties that are identical and which are functionally equivalent? And finally, I think it's important that we truly integrate the study of far-right parties into the mainstream study of political science, notably electoral behavior and political parties. And I come back to what I kind of started with. Like, how do you best read? Now, I believe that my 2007 book, which was way more successful than I had anticipated, um, I actually thought no one would ever use the term populist radical right. Um, I think one of the reasons why it, why it has had the impact that it has had is because it, in, it, it includes a lot of insights from other literature, mainstream literature on electoral behavior, mainstream literature on political parties. I mean, it's not that I'm so brilliant. I, mean, I read brilliant people. And I thank my supervisor for that, Peter Mayer, who actually, when I started my PhD with him, and I'd written my MA about it, and I was fairly obsessive. I'd read roughly everything about the far right I could find. He actually barred me from reading about the far right for half a year and said, you have to read other stuff. Um, 
and later I, I, I by and large have kept doing that and so I always had this rule that at least once a week I had to read an article that had nothing to do with my PhD. Um, and I think this is really, really important. It's important to go to talks about other stuff that you just think, oh, but that's not relevant to your PhD. That's probably going to be more relevant to it because it makes you think differently about things. If you only read the literature exactly on what you do, you stay within that box. And the way to stand out is either be brilliant, and very few of us are brilliant, or to have better data, and very few of us have better data. Whereas the way to, to really stand out often is to look differently at the same thing. And the only way to look differently at the same thing is by reading outside of it. And so if you're working on political parties, read about political parties. If you read about if you work on social movements, don't read only about right-wing social movements, read about all social movements, right? <clears throat> and at times just read something about political economy or political theory. And <clears throat> also think about what the value of your study is. Like a lot of the literature on radical right speaks to literature on the radical right. Which, yet yeah, today you see this in this room, there are hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people, who study the radical right. But the radical right says something about our society. And the transformation of the radical right says something that is relevant to everyone studying electoral politics or studying party behavior. And so if you read something about that broader thing, you can link it to that. And that makes your study more useful. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Cass. Uh, I suggest then, uh, yeah, we open the floor for a round of uh, Q&A. Don't be shy, so whoever wants to go first, please raise your hands. Uh, when you when you start asking your question, can you please introduce yourself so that we all know who we are? Hi, I'm. Everyone hear me? I know. Uh, I'm Ed Pertwee from London School of Economics. Thank you very much for a really interesting and stimulating opening talk. Closer. Closer. Yeah. Better. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for that really interesting, stimulating opening talk. Um, given some of the um, issues you were raising about needing to think about the far right in relation to the mainstream, um, and also some of the things you were saying about the far right in relation to mainstream conservatism and the way that it's often been mainstream right parties that have benefited at times from, um, from the economic crisis and... and other things. Um, I was wondering what that you think that says about the way we constitute the object of inquiry. Um, is it still fair to talk about a radical right or far right party family as a distinct thing? Because you could argue in many contexts, you gave the example of Fidesz in Hungary, for example, um, part of the story is about the transformation of supposedly mainstream conservative parties in a more radical direction. You could also argue in a UK context that many of the important parts of the story around the radical right, quote unquote, are what's going on within the conservative party. And presumably you could also say something similar in a US context where a lot of the interesting transformations have been internal to the Republican party. So I just wondered about what you thought that said in terms of the way we actually go about constituting the object of, of knowledge. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that in more detail um, later about categorization, right? I think it's actually a fundamental challenge at the moment. Um, we have gotten away with very sloppy conceptualization and categorization because I remember like in the early 1990s, any party that spoke 
somewhat negatively about immigration. We just put in the box of the radical right, and it was fair enough because they all belonged there. Like if you look further, now of course you would have to put everyone in that box virtually, and so we have to be much clearer. And it turns out that we haven't thought much about that. Like, and so what? when does a party become radical right? We've always been very good at categorizing parties that were new and were like suspicious from the beginning. But when parties changed, and we had this with FPO, right, and then with SVP, and it's like, are they really radical right? And then when was that moment? Now, first of all, it will always be dodgy when exactly it starts, but it does force us to think better about what defines a party. So think about the Republican Party. Right? So what defines that party? Is it their leader as far as American parties have one leader, but is it Trump? Is it the Congress, the Republican base in the Congress? Or is it the Republican voter? Right? On the basis of that, I would say Trump, radical right, although he doesn't have an ideology, he nevertheless has radical right instincts. Congress, not. Voters, radical right. But if you look at the platform, it's not. But what does that mean in like the US, right? Now, Fidesz is a very interesting example, too. If you look at the platform, Fidesz undoubtedly still has largely a conservative party platform, right? But Fidesz is in power by itself and implements a radical right program, so clearly you go there. Um, I'm very reluctant to, to reclassify long existing parties on the basis of one campaign. So the Tories are a good example of that. I think the Tories are still fairly messy internally. Uh, I don't rule it out that they go to the radical right, but at the moment I see them all over the place. Um, the Republicans are a little bit the same. Uh, Likud in Israel is another example which has a very strong radical right faction where Netanyahu is clearly uh, pandering to and, and listening to, but whether the whole party has moved. But I, I also can't objectively say, like, this is that. or What is important is that you argue why, right? And so my approach to ideologies has always been not so much counting words, um, but looking at what is, the, what is the structure of the argument, what informs what. And so you can actually say very nativist things without being nativist. Um, if you, for the rest, have uh, an ideology that, that accepts multi-ethnicity and those kind of things, but during a certain campaign, you just go full out, right? But if you do it for a very long time, then at a certain point in time, like, it doesn't matter whether your program is still saying all the conservative stuff. If you, by and large, govern and speak in a predominantly radical right voice. Um, you are that. I think it is important though that I don't, I don't use radical right as in a relative term. Again, so at the moment, because I do a lot of public writing too, I get a lot of pushback. It's like, how, how can this be radical? Because everyone believes this, right? That it's radical because it goes against liberal democracy. Right? And so I have no problem if the terminology that I've been using would mean that half of the parties are radical right. Well, I have a problem, but as a citizen, not as an academic, right? That's possible. Um, at the same time, we also have to think about terms. Like, I mean, I think it's important that academic terms relate to public debates, which is why I'm very hesitant to come up with a new term that would be academically a better term for the sake of argument, it would be better to say populist authoritarian nativist rather than populist radical right. But who's going to use that? Like, and, and how, how can I relate to a, a public debate about it? On the other hand, 
if the public if the public discourse gets too far away from a clear academic discourse, you have to adjust too. But what it speaks to is exactly the point I hope to make. I think we're at the moment in what is a fourth wave of the radical right, and in the fourth wave, we have a mainstreaming of the radical right, which has all kind of different things, including conservative parties becoming radical right, radical right parties being coalitionsfähig in most countries, right, and radical right politics being taking place well outside of radical right parties. And, and this, is, this is really testing us, because a lot of the theories, for example, are like, well, they're anti-immigration, that's why people vote for them. And so are a lot of other parties, so why would they still vote for them? So that's why I think we really need to look back and, and think like, okay, so this made sense in the 1990s, but today, does this still hold? Thanks. Uh, is there any... My name is Paulus Wagner. I'm a PhD student in Paris at Sciences Po. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, I have one question. Um, in your paper uh, on the fourth wave uh, of radical right studies and um, also in your talk you focus on, you focus on political parties and the definition of the, of the radical right is rather one that applies to the, to the formal space of politics, to political actors, to the, to the um, supply side maybe. And you mentioned that possibly in, in an earlier wave of studies, the demand side um, was of higher interest. But one question that I'm posing to myself is, um, shouldn't we have a more profoundly sociological view on the, what we call the demand for, for radical right politics in our societies? Um, and also, shouldn't we study um, formal political, like political actors in the context of the ensemble of, of things that they, they make part of, you know, not meaning the, the political actions or their, their ability to, to mobilize? So um, I, I know that this is probably because of um, applied political science has for its aim to... to Supply side, but um, I think that our studies of the demand should go beyond what is the classic, and this is a um, correlative study based on survey data and only looking at a single point of time at a single year. So, if you have a thought about this, thank you. I mean, that, this is the big frustration of anyone who tries to do that type of research. Yes, we should, but can we? I, I mean. The biggest problem of quantitative political science is data. And we generally start to generate data by the time that something becomes relevant. Right? We only have good data on populist attitudes from the moment that populism became big. So we don't know whether, at, at, at the supply side level to a certain extent, so we actually don't know whether there was already a demand for it 10 years earlier. Because we, we didn't ask. And on top of that, we don't have panel data on virtually anything. And so, yes, we should do it, but I'm a bit skeptical about doing stuff that might sound interesting when you don't have the data for it. Because what you're then going to do is you're going to find proxies. Right? So rather than actually have a good operationalization, you just look at what question comes closest. Right? And that covers, at best, a very tiny part of it. So one of the things in populism, it's anti-establishment attitudes, which, yes, is part of populism, but it's only a part of it. And you can, you can trace anti-establishment sentiments over decades, but call it anti-establishment sentiments and don't say, well, this is a proxy of populism, because it, it isn't. And it, it, it claims much more than you actually do. Um, and so the other thing is, yes, we should study stuff in their context. I mean, I think another problem is that much of comparative politics is actually not comparative. Like, I mean, most electoral studies are not comparative. They just pull the data of various different countries and the national context is completely taken out. Comparative politics means that you compare different things, not that you pull different things. 
if you particularly want to understand movements or actors or parties, I believe the national context is crucial. If you want to understand Fidesz, you can talk whatever you want about post-communism or globalization, but if you don't understand like, that the Socialist Party imploded because of a very specific corruption scandal before that, you're not getting it. Right? And so I, I think that in that sense, I would love to see many more studies of one country or two countries or three countries at best. At the same time, I have tenure, like my career is made and I can do all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm even like still in the last month of editing a journal, which is a pretty prestigious journal, which has as a rule that we don't publish single country studies, um, only in exceptional cases where you can make a convincing theoretical argument why that case speaks to broader cases. Um, and we can go back and forth on that, but <clears throat> the political economy of, of academia today is that if you make that phenomenal study that truly explains why something happened in one country, or even two countries, you're going to end up in a second or third tier journal and the person who's going to use proxies to do a much worse job on the basis of 24 countries is going to be in the top journal, right? And, and so that's how it is, right? I mean, I teach my graduate students at UGA by and large telling them don't do what I do because you won't have a career. Um, so you, you have to find a way to to do as good as you can without undermining your own career. But I think what is, what is important, again, is the better theoretically informed you are, the more you can do with one or two cases. Right? And you need to know about cases. Right? If you're going to make your argument that this plays out broader, you can state that which I often see like with manuscripts submitted to EJPR. And it's like, yeah, I don't think so. Like you make no point why that would be the case. I can make five why it isn't the case. If you know several cases, you can make that case and say, look, I'm studying France, right? France is exceptional in this compared to the others, but these things play out broader. And so it, that, that's the way around it. But yes, we should study things in, in context, but data limitations, particularly with public opinion, are phenomenal. Uh, Leonie de Jonge from the University of Cambridge. Um, you mentioned that unlike with other party families, like the Greens, for instance, there are no openly sympathetic scholars to the far right, and that is or very few, and that is problematic for various reasons. So I wanted to ask you what you think the role of academics are more generally in the study of the far right. Well, to be clear, I thought it was very problematic that there were mostly pro-Greens writing about the Greens. And I think one of the reasons why much of the scholarship on Green parties was problematic in the early phase was that these were activists writing who did a great job at describing the history and, 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 the, and the ideas, but they had a hard time coming to terms with the fact that Greens are actually not very successful. Right? And so at the same time, many radical right have, or original stu studies have a hard time with understanding why the radical right is successful. Um, because the bias comes in. You don't need to be neutral, and you can be. I just don't believe in neutral science. I think it is important that you're aware of your bias and that it doesn't significantly affect your scholarship. I mean, I'm very outspoken and very clearly anti-radical right. Um, I don't lie about that. Most of the radical right people I meet know that, and even earlier they kind of knew that. I do think that most of my studies are not negatively informed by that. And in part, is like even if you are studying the radical right because you're upset about it and, and worried about it, 
right? You can only defeat it if you understand it well. And to understand it well, you have to have as little bias as possible, right? And so it's even self-defeating to write from a purely ideological point of anti-radical right point of view because it will make your study less good, which means it will make the response less good. There are few, there are very, very few right-wing people studying the radical right. I can think about two, probably. Um, again, I don't mind. I think what is, what is important is that you see things in perspective. Right? And, and one of the things, particularly if you talk, I mean, at, at times just think about, okay, so if I would study this phenomenon, be it voters or parties or mobilization, from a left-wing perspective, would I do the same? Right? If I'm talking, so my, my first book, my PhD, was about party families. Right? And while everyone always called me a scholar of the radical right, I actually thought I was a scholar of parties. I could have written that book on the liberal parties, on Christian democratic parties, on social democratic parties, it would have been exactly the same book. Obviously with me being unemployed, but like, <clears throat> theoretically there was nothing radical right about it. And sometimes there are specific things to the radical right, though even those are hardly ever unique to the radical right. But I think that it's important to check your bias, right? I mean, you have to be aware of, of it, and you can openly state it, or even if you are aware of it, I think it, it will come through in, in, in the study. There is this myth in US political science that we can be neutral. Um, neutral mostly means that we that we abide by the status quo. And the status quo is ideologically definitely not neutral. So I think rather than trying to fight that and become utopian and like floating above the world, um, you, you do a much better job by just thinking, okay, so like, where do I stand? Is this influencing me? Do I ask this question because it's the radical right? And I assume it does this and that. Or do I ask this question because they're political parties and this is what we think political parties do? Um, in thinking about gender in right-wing movements, um, and the premise that the radical right is built on the concept of nativism. Um, how can we look at some organizations, I'm coming from the United States context, and yes, frequently um, racism or anti-Muslim or anti-immigrant sentiments are intertwined in many of the most misogynist groups, just as misogyny tends to appear in uh, groups that are driven primarily by nativism. But something like promise keepers is privileging the idea of racial reconciliation. They are attempting to take a non-nativist perspective, looking at them historically, um, whereas the role of, of patriarchy is the primary core ideology. And then moving forward into the contemporary period, uh, many of the strains of the alt-right that are built upon men's rights, red pill, and other ideologies um, have misogyny as their core um, focus. So can the concept of xenophobia and nativism be extended to include a group whose core ideology is misogyny rather than a ethno-racial, religiously focused kind of problem. And most of these misogynist groups are authoritarian, so they quite easily make that step up to radical right. Um, or is that somehow um, something that we, the term of nativism and xenophobia can't really quite encompass the role that misogyny plays as a core motivating ideology? 
That's a great question, and you should definitely ask that on Friday when Kathleen is here. Um, so, channeling her, um, her Oslo speech, one of the things she said that was very interesting is like, should we look at this as a gender aspect of nationalism, or is it a nationalist aspect of gender, right? And and so the question is, what is what is prior, what is primary, and what is secondary? Um, I think it's important not to conflate the two. I think there's a fair chance that almost all nativist, all nativism um, is misogynist for the simple reason that almost all nativism finds its expression within misogynist societies and cultures. But theoretically, I don't see any reason that should there be a matriarchal society that A, it can be nativist, and B, that that nativism will be in line with the matriarchal belief. And so I think conceptually they should be separated even though it's very likely that empirically they, come, they occur together, and probably they are interlinked. Um, now what is the most important one is something that has to be a, has to be established empirically um, by looking at is it because of the because of the misogyny that they're nativist or is it because of their nativism that they're misogynistic and perhaps in certain cases it's just one like it just comes together but but that's the difference between theory and and empirics, I think, as long as you theoretically can think about a non-misogynist nativism, there are two different things. We clearly have empirical non-nativist misogynism, right? Um, I, I, I think the whole issue of misogyny as well as masculinity is kind of a blind spot in the study of the radical right, and, and to a certain extent one of the more interesting ones, because if I take the example of the Netherlands, like the party for freedom has misogyny and, and nativism, but it has this kind of old school sexism. The role of the man is to protect the, the woman, the white woman, obviously, against the barbarian, over-sexualized Muslim men. But the woman is, is kind of the virgin or the mother, right? There's innocence there and, and sex is within the relationship, although it's the Netherlands, so it's a bit more flexible, but, um, but it's classic kind of sexism. When you look at Thierry Baudet and his Forum for Democracy, he has a misogyny that comes very close to the old right in the US, and so now it's no longer the white male protecting the white female against the, the Muslim barbarian. Um, but it is like remarks like if a woman says no, she just means that you have to push harder, right? And so now it's, it's the woman as having to be available for sex with the man. And so it's not anymore this virgin or mother type. It, it is, is subservient in a sexual way to, to men, and, it, and they have this distinction between real women and feminist non-women and all that kind of, and it's very, very new, and it clearly, I think it is interesting because it speaks to a very different view of society, and one of the things that, I think it's a generational issue to a certain extent as well, so for Geert Wilders and he, him and his viewers, they live in a masculine world, in a men-dominated world. Right? Baudet, and particularly his students, live in a world which they think is being dominated by women, um, and where there's male victimhood. And while that might sound bizarre, I think it's nevertheless very telling of how they perceive the world. And so, is it the main driver? I don't know. Like Michael Kimmel just published this book on uh, masculinity and uh, and the far right, actually also a bit 
on jihadism. It's a fantastic book. Um, and he argues that it's primarily about masculinity and identity is more important than ideology. I'm very skeptical about it, but I definitely think that masculinity also plays a significant role. Is there something specific about radical right masculinity compared to conservative masculinity? Not even that sure. I think that much of what Forum for Democracy says out loud is very popular within non-nativist conservatives. Um, but again, I think it is, it is very important to study, and both from a nativist perspective of view as from a pure like misogynism point of view. Thanks. Thanks, Kaz. Um, my name is Omran from the University of York. Um, you mentioned that research on the radical right has become quite normalised, and there are hundreds and hundreds of studies now looking at uh, uh, the attitudes of potential voters, and also studies suggesting the ideal strategy for radical right parties. And I was wondering whether there's been if there's any evidence of radical right parties taking this academic work and actually adapting their own policy as a result of it. And whether you see any problems of that of that happening? It's, it's kind of difficult because obviously no political party is very open about how they make their policies. What you do see is that if if academics consider a certain party not radical right, which is more broadly seen as radical right, that sometimes this will be mentioned by leaders and right? say, look. According to that scholar, we're not radical, right? Um, I've not come across it that much. To be honest, I don't necessarily speak that much with radical right leaders. Um, there are a few that clearly read the stuff. And I know, like, Flams Belang used to read most of what I read, what I wrote. Whether they actually did anything with it, I don't know. It was a question that was asked when I was doing my PhD, which was in that context when everything was very politicized. And my answer was always the same. Like, I mean, the radical right can use it, and the opponents of the radical right can use it. Like, and if it's true that the radical right uses more successfully, then the opponents of radical right have not done their job well. Like, I don't think it should be a concern, uh, not for academic work. I think if your academic, if your question is academically relevant like, and, and advances knowledge, then the way that knowledge is translated into politics is something that you can play a role in. I mean, you can translate it to the people that you support and say, look, from this we know this and that. Right? But I don't think you should not publish something because you're worried that the radical right will use it. Because first of all, you don't know. Like I describe one Dutch party as anti-Semitic and the other one as not. And so you would think like, well, the one that is anti-Semitic is going to be upset. And they weren't. They were very happy and they will say, look, you can see we're actually the real ones. Like those other ones are just softies. Um, so you, you don't know what is being used. Um, I think it's also totally fair to to do political advocacy with your own work, right? And just don't expect too much out of it. Like, I mean, I'm doing this tour for six weeks now. I don't know how many people I've talked to and politicians and journalists and whatever. I have no illusion that I've changed any minds. Like, the best what you can do is provide an empirical basis for people who have sympathy for your position so that they can they can defend that position better but don't think that you're going into a room with like politicians and you say well my study found this and they say oh okay we should do that then like doesn't work Anyone else? Uh, Thank you very much. 
what I was wondering about when you brought up that very good point about mainstream and, and niche parties, I am an opposition activist in Hungary, and uh, I have been uh, living in this situation for a long time right, uh, that uh, I am radical and extreme and clandestine uh, if, if you want, when I, when I go back to my hometown, uh, which has a Jobbik mayor, and that is just the, the normal, the mainstream right there. When, and what I was wondering about whether our theoretical, conceptual frameworks that we are using for these parties can actually be used right now um, for the tiny uh, and, and very out of ma mainstream, out of consensus opposition in places like Hungary, where it has really um, become something that is um, clearly in a large majority. Yeah, I mean, in power to you, um, at least someone from the Hungarian opposition who still uh, has some fire. Um, I was just in Budapest and um, I was pretty disappointed to to hear, um, and by and large, how many opposition politicians had kind of accepted defeat and um, and it, but now it goes to. I've, I've actually tried to get away from the term mainstream parties or established parties because even established uh, Front National is established, right, with any meaning. But it's very again, it's very hard. Like in academic work, it would be easier for me than. Like, I mean, I write a column for The Guardian to not use those type of terms that everyone thinks about, but then to not include Fidesz or even Jobbik to a certain extent as mainstream in a Hungarian context is bizarre, right? And so mainstream, I think, has been used really as liberal democratic. The, ma the mainstream parties were the liberal democratic parties. So Christian Democrats, conservatives, social Democrats, liberals, greens, right? Um, and so perhaps that is a way better term. As said, I, I define radical as anti-liberal democratic. And so whether that is a minority or majority depends on the context. It is irrespective of where most people stand. But it does, again, create that, that conflict between academic language and general language. That if the, if the vast, like Hungary, two-thirds of the population vote for radical right parties, right? And so considering radical right ideology as radical sounds very weird to, to many people in Hungary who are like, what's radical? That's just our government party and our main opposition party. Um, now, Hungary is fortunately not the whole of Europe, and, and so what applies to Hungary doesn't apply to Germany, for example. Um, but it is something to really think about much more, but not then simply saying, oh, well, they, they, they're no longer radical, and I just use another term. No, I mean, this is consequences of then what radical does mean and what mainstream means, and I think what it, what everything forces us to do is to think better about some choices that we made that were fine in the 1990s, right, in the early 21st century, but simply at this point in time don't work that well and need refinement. Um, in that, terms are not neutral, right, and so there's a lot of debate about that and there's, there's choices that are informed by political ideas, like there's a reason why many people still talk about mainstream parties excluding the radical rights, a normative argument, not an empirical argument. All of that is, to me, all of that is fine, right? As long as you're explicit about it. But if you, if you define radical in a purely national context, it becomes almost impossible in a comparative context. So if radical, if radical are the parties that are against the mainstream, then, th then that is fine. But then if you are comparing radical parties across different countries, then don't assume that they actually have an ideological core. Then that could be liberal Democrats in one country, radical right in another, whatever. 
greens in yet another. Um, I'm Hans Noll from uh, Georgetown University, um, and I have a question. There's sort of two themes in your talk that I want to turn around and ask a, a question about. The first theme is, you know, this is the latest wave in our understanding of um, right-wing populism and, and where we want to go in, the, in that pushing that field forward. And then the second theme is that there's lots of other disciplines and other subfields within political science that will have useful things to say to help push that forward. Um, I'm mainly studying the United States and I'm here because I'm interested in the reverse of that, which is what is it that I can take from understanding right-wing populism and try to help me understand things that aren't necessarily going to be studied under that umbrella. Um, so I wonder if you could think about what are the lessons, what are the things that we know now or are trying to learn now about right-wing populism that would be most useful to those of us who study political parties broadly, electoral behavior broadly, or something else? Yeah, um, it's a good question and, and very relevant at this moment when we have an explosion in populism studies and everything is populism and everyone wants to write about populism and act as if it's something new. Um, I mean, first of all, I think it is, particularly if you study Trump, right, which most, I mean, most Americans do when they talk about populism, it's important that it's not populism, it's the radical right. If you look at literature, which is, which is really a problem at the moment, I see that in, in articles by new scholars of populism, they only use literature that has populism in it, as if something that says radical right is not relevant for radical right populism. Um, and so there, there is literature on that. And actually, there's a classic from 1955 by Seymour Martin Lipset about the radical right in America, which pretty much explains Trump, um, even though several people are explaining him now with that same argument of 1955 without referencing it, um, state is anxiety. Um, I think what is important is kind of this pathological normalcy argument, with, particularly in the American context. Like in, in the US, the radical right has always been seen as external. And this idea of, like I remember 10 years ago, I came to the US and I taught a course on the radical right. Um, and I asked my students, what do you think about? And so they could think about Nazis and the Klan. Right? That, that was the only thing that they could think about with the term radical right. And for the rest, the radical right was in Europe. Right? It was, it was un-American. You hear that now the whole time, like the US debate. This is not who we are. Like how blind should you be to American history to argue that you're not misogynist, you're not racist, you're not authoritarian in, in, in certain ways. Um, and so I think what the populism literature can show, although there's not that much specifically on the US, is how it relates to the mainstream and, and why there are not specific reasons why the US is different outside of a party system, electoral system thing. Um, in, I think that, and I've been doing quite a lot of reading about the US lately myself, and the US has a lot of literature on populism, but it's, it's, very, uh, it's very narrow. And so <clears throat> I think one of the big, big problems that we will have in studying where does Trump come from is this massive vacuum of decades in which we didn't study populist radical right because it didn't have a party political voice. Right? And so we have a little bit of, of work on the Southern strategy, very, very little even, even that which was a nativist strategy of the Republican Party to get the white Southerners from the Democrat to the Republican Party which clearly is the fundament of the nativist politics of, of Trump today. And, and the other thing is that um, I think it, it would be good to look at populism, the few cases of populism in the US at the, at the state level, 
um, because it did exist in one form or another in certain states in certain periods, like from Huey Long to, of course, George Wallace and, and whatever. Um, but I think that if you look at some of, and, and particularly if, if, you, if you purely look at why did people vote for Trump, I mean, this whole economic anxiety versus cultural backlash argument, we have two decades of that in Europe. Like it's just frightening to see how similar that debate is and how it completely ignores decades of it. Um, and so, yeah, just go beyond purely the term populism and, and look at radical right. And then also see the interaction. But again, the, the party system, of course, in the US is very, very specific. And, and I think, as a last point, I think it is very, very important to not reduce the Trump vote to a radical right populist vote. I mean, you know this, but I, I find it amazing how many papers today are about populism and they use Brexit and Trump as the prime examples. Like both are both are establishment insight like activities. Like Brexit comes out of the Conservative Party, which was pushed through by UKIP. Uh, but UKIP alone would never have created Brexit. And Trump as a third party candidate would not have been above 15%, right? And so it, it, it's important. Yes, they have similarities with Fond National, but Fond National is only Fond National, right? And, and that is what most of our literature is about. And so if you look at the electorate of Trump, it is fundamentally different from the electorate of Fond National because it is the mainstream Republican electorate together with perhaps a small percentage of specific Trump voters that wouldn't vote for, like, um, wouldn't vote for the Republicans otherwise. Other questions? Uh, if not, uh, we only have to thank Cass for this uh, presentation, for this discussion. Then uh, we're a little bit uh, ahead of schedule, but uh, the next step is uh, that we're moving to the class where the first methods class by Matteo Albanese will take place. Uh, but before that, we could uh, actually introduce ourselves, get to know each other a little bit better, and also have a small coffee break. So the room is uh, on the corridor uh, down there. We will show you the way.